to Wrestling Rewind. I am Zach Romero and this uh, is my wrestling DVD shelf. On it holds countless documentaries, wrestling shows, best ofs, etc. It's my own little hall of fame of great moments in wrestling. Today we're going over a new potential entry on this shelf, namely from TNA Wrestling. Total Nonstop Action or TNA Wrestling was founded in 2002 by Jeff and Jerry Jarrett out of Nashville, Tennessee. The original philosophy for the company stemmed from the end of the Monday Night Wars, when Vince McMahon bought out World Championship Wrestling. WCW's loyal fan base had been left completely hanging once WWE had thoroughly dismantled their roster, their legacy, and left it as basically a joke. Jeff Jarrett sought to capture this lost audience by building up where the previous company had left off, but do it better this time. So since then, TNA has labeled itself as the second biggest professional wrestling company in the world, and the successor to WWE's pop culture throne. So for today's episode, we look at TNA's Victory Road 2011, which was filmed on March 13th at Universal Studios in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Match number one, Bully Ray versus Tommy Dreamer in a no DQ match. I, hold on, I was under the impression I was watching a TNA show from the early 2010s, not a best of from Extreme Championship Wrestling in 1997. Well, it turns out this is still TNA, but an important factor to remember is that although Jeff Jarrett wanted this to be a better WCW, it implemented a lot of tactics that ultimately caused WCW to slip on its own proverbial dick. One such tactic was filming at a studio amusement park. The other was combing through discarded WWE talent to see if there's anything that still had life in it. So these two heroes of ECW battle it out, and at one point, the two decide to go back to the trope well and attempt to take weapons from the audience. The problem is, however, this is not a hardcore Philly audience in the early 90s. In fact, because TNA is filmed at Universal Studios, you've got an audience comprised of 40% serious wrestling fanboys and 60% tourists who are killing time until the wait line for the Harry Potter ride dies down. So when Bully and Tommy calm the crowd for weaponry, they get a wimpy chair shot, a refreshing bottle of water, and a giant stuffed carnival animal. The fact that it's clearly a minion from Despicable Me completely befuddles one of the color commentators and Cuban equivalent of a brick, Taz. You don't know what that is. What is that? Help me, somebody! That's not SpongeBob, right? I don't know what the hell that is! Now keep in mind, I could literally do an entire video just on how terrible Taz is, and the internet and Botchamania have already done a better job of going into those details more than I ever could. But just know, he's f***ing terrible. So the match goes on. Shenanigans ensue, both men are competent here, but both men have had better versions of this match already. Match number two, Angelina Love and Winter versus Sarita and Rosita for the TNA Knockouts Tag Team Titles. Okay, so I pooped on the company a little bit back there, so let me just back the truck up for a second. Are you telling me that TNA not only has a serious female division, but so serious that it constitutes a goddamn tag team title? Holy sh that's incredible. But I'm genuinely blown away at the progression of TNA. So we see these two teams go, and it's not very good. Like, just not great women's wrestling. It's bad. And although, yes, this is taking place in 2011, when you watch the women in NXT or just unbelievable female performers in the indies, seeing these four women flop and slap around just doesn't cut it. The tandem moves just hang out until way after the fact, then drop on nothing. Like, the philosophy is there. They have enthusiastic female talent. It's just this particular slice is doo-doo. So, how does this match end? Oh, <laughs> basic bull distraction into roll-up, which then gets turned into chicken sh heel reversal. Okay, good. And then everyone waits entirely too long for the ref distraction to end, and Jesus Christ, finally, one, two, three. It takes so long for Hebner to get done with whatever he's doing to come in and make the count that both the pinner and the pin E are both giving Hebner the stink eye when he gets in. Match number three, Hernandez versus Matt Morgan in a first blood match. Okay, so we have two male competitors who are actually mostly known for being in TNA. And at the start of this match, they actually go after each other. Believe it or not, these two realistically build a story in this match. Not to mention, it's 2011, and this is supposed to be an honest-to-God first blood match. After Cowboy Bob Orton oopsed Undertaker with the hepatitis scare in 2005, 
Blood sports sort of slowed down in the bigger wrestling companies. So this setup is some old school brutality that I gotta respect. So things are amping up between these two combatants when suddenly, what the fuck? Alright, so apparently some tourist hopped the gate and jumped in the ring, the ref makes a surprisingly decent tackle, and our broadcast duo recovers by saying... nothing. Great job, fellas. So while the ref is dragging out the nutty fanboy, Hernandez grabs a chain to cheat with and win this damn thing. So wait, was the fan run in a work then? Because it's distracting the ref? Like, this is some meta if this is how they're going to deal with that. I, that could be impressive. So Matt Morgan dodges the chain and clocks Hernandez with it hard. Ah, and here comes the magic. Hernandez sulks away and, uh, cut to another camera. This isn't the view you want right now. Cut, cut to a different camera. The, the man is cutting his fucking forehead. Cut away for Christ's sake. Thank you. So we cut to the ref who mysteriously has taken a bump and is out of commission, meaning that the fanboy interference was not a work. And as the ref was coming back after dealing with that, realized he was supposed to be down and hurt at this time. So then he just went right into that. So then Hernandez gets up, squirts Morgan with stage blood, a new ref shows up, and oh, that blood is definitely real. Morgan loses. Really? We're ending a first blood match with fake blood? Uh, well, I guess the joke here is on anybody who's ever competed in this type of match, because instead of this showcase of gory, just ugh, hardcore mentality, apparently you can just... Splash some Heinz 57 on your opponent and just call it a day. Match number four, the Ultimate X title match. This is the match type that put TNA on the map, baby. Like if Money in the Bank was designed by a nine-year-old, it's a fatal four-way style match with the X Division title hanging above the ring by two extra turnbuckle ropes. So it's all the excitement of a ladder match, except way more dangerous for no real reason. Before the match, we get some small interviews with all of the combatants to try to bring up some kind of storyline. We start with Robbie, E, and Cookie bullshitting around a food truck for no real reason. Wow. The Jersey Shore gimmicked wrestler. What a horribly dated reference not even five years after this show was on. Next, we see Generation Me, the tag team of Max and Jeremy Buck. Look, I know in another video I think I did a rant about terrible wrestling names, so I'm going to try to keep this short. What happened with Generation Me exactly? The young Bucks walked into TNA's office, crotch chopping and too sweet, and Bischoff said, We love your look, we love your attitude, we love everything, but young Bucks is just never going to work as a team name. No, now you'll be Generation Me, and instead of Matt and Nick Jackson, you'll be Max and Jeremy Buck because... Your young Bucks. If you're gonna have the name be that close, just fucking call them the Young Bucks! What's the problem? So their promo is that every man's for himself in this match, which is awkward because they're a team. So Max decides he should be the one to win the title tonight, whether his brother wants to help him or not. That is the closest thing we get to real drama for this match. And our final promo is from current X Division champion, Kazarian. He explained that he's been in more Ultimate X matches than anyone else. He was in the first one eight years ago, and when it's all said and done, this type of match can shorten careers, it can end careers, and you are damn sure it can make careers which is the most depressing thing I think I've ever seen in a wrestling promo. And not because of the already dated five minutes after it was said Charlie Sheen reference. Winning. But because if this type of match can make a career, eight years later, why isn't he in the main event yet? Like, eight years in the big ultimate super match for the next generation, and he's won it before, and all that so an old guy in chrome makeup can be the world champion. So the match is uneven. There's moments of excitement, confusion, weird lulls, and the weird subplot of Max Buck wanting Jeremy to help him for some reason becomes he literally cannot move to the belt unless Jeremy helps him move. Then, of course, Greed gets the better of them, and the brothers feud for three minutes. So anyway, the match keeps scooting along with everyone making several attempts to scuttle to the title, and finally this thing wraps up, with Robbie just grabbing a goddamn ladder while Kazarian just tightrope walks across. Looks like they're setting up for like a tug-of-war kind of thing, but it lasts like three seconds and then Kazarian just grabbed the title. So, just like the first blood match, if you're allowed to just do whatever you want, why isn't everybody doing that? If you show the audience the solution is done by legal cheating, then it opens up the Pandora's box of loopholes. Why didn't everybody use a ladder? Why didn't everybody just climb off the fucking rafter part? Why, what, why even have the match then? Well, at least this win will make Kazarian's career now. Oh, wait. TNA Vignette Series, Jeff Jarrett's Honeymoon. All right, so randomly inserted in the pay-per-view is a series of small vignettes starring Jeff Jarrett and his new wife, Karen. Now, all of these segments have the same basic gimmick. Karen wants a traditional romantic honeymoon, and Jeff continues to no-sell her and keeps partying with their terrifying pack of children. That's the joke. For, like... 
five different segments. And what makes this even more insulting is that these vignettes are clearly filmed at Universal Studios in Orlando, as in the same Universal that all TNA shows at this time were filmed at, as in these are the laziest vignettes in the history of wrestling. Seriously, how long does this take to plan out? Like 10 seconds? Hey, uh, Double J, why don't you go over to the Hulk coaster, go ahead and give your kids a pizza, call your wife a bitch, Okay, let's go home. And of course, they amount to nothing. Match number five, Beer Money versus Ink Ink for the tag team titles. So you've got the TNA cornerstone, Beer Money, just given the most tasteful promo you could ask for. And their opponents are Ink Ink, a team of a Marine and a Matt Hardy lackey who are suddenly hardcore gutter punks because they have tattoos. Who cares? Who cares about this tag team match? Beer Money wins. Match number six, AJ Styles versus Matt Hardy with Ric Flair. So prior to this fight, we get a pre-match promo. According to Storyline, Flair had just double-crossed his most recent Four Horsemen rehash to join with Matt Hardy for some reason. As you can see with this interview, they don't even make eye contact with one another. There is literally zero chemistry as a team, a mentorship. They both look like they'd rather be doing something else right now. Hardy and Styles have a competent matchup, lots of back and forth, lots of Matt Hardy out of breath, etc. Much like the hardcore match opener, this match isn't awful by any means, but it's safe to say that all three men involved have had better matches in their careers. I will say though, even when we only get to see the aftermath of it, a post-match slap to the cock is always a great note to end on. Match number seven, Mr. Anderson versus Rob Van Dam for the number one contendership. So two men thrown to the waist side from WWE coming together to wait a minute was there a former WWE person in like every match in this card 75% of the show was WWE's sloppy seconds that's fucking devastating the company had been around for almost 10 years at this point and they can only drum up barely a dozen homegrown talent what kind of sense does that make? Jesus, where was I? Oh, yeah, Botchamania over here. So, I don't know if it was just that these two didn't jive, or if RVD is as terrible as everybody likes to tell me he is, but these two just keep banging into another, and it just fucking looks terrible. So the match gets out to the outside, the two going back and forth, and with one big, kind of Russian leg sweep, both men are counted out in a number one contenders match to decide who's fighting the world champion. Double count out. And the crowd unanimously comes together to demand that they restart this match and come to a definitive conclusion for this. The old dusty finish. TNA promptly ignores them and moves on to the next match. Match number eight, Sting versus Jeff Hardy for the TNA world title. So this is it. The main event for this pay-per-view. And you know, for a show that supposedly lives in infamy for being one of TNA's worst, it really wasn't that bad. Middle of the road, maybe. Boring, perhaps. But not, like, offensively bad. Number one contender shit the bed, but eh, still. So what we have here is recently returning Sting as your world champion versus the bitter heel Jeff Hardy. Or at least that's what the hype video is telling me. So Jeff Hardy comes out first and, hmm, that is the most subdued I have ever seen his entrance. He's a one-man rave party, right? Like, I'm thinking of the right guy. Hold on, let me check something real quick. Yeah, that's who I'm thinking of. So, what gives here? Wait a minute, hold on. Now, I know you know a thing or two about prescription medication. What I don't think you realize is that you have to go to a doctor to legally obtain some. So, Jeff Hardy has had issues with drug use. So, despite that weird awkwardness, out comes Sting, and this thing is about to happen. As soon as Jeff can get his fucking ass in the ring. Hello, we're kind of in the middle of something here. So we get the announcements underway and once again interrupted. So Eric Bischoff comes out, has a few words with Jeff, has a few words with Sting, I guess, then announces that it's suddenly no disqualification match for some reason. So we begin. And I gotta say, not to blow up anybody here, but Sting is still in decent enough shape that I really believe he can still go. Yeah, he's not ripped to bejesus and back, but even if he was, he'd look ridiculous at his age, like how Sylvester Stallone looks now. So if he gives the younger Hardy a run for his money, I won't cry foul. I mean, what the f***? How... How is this over? Dost thou shitteth me? Uh, what happened here? What, how much was that? It was like 88 seconds. What in the holy hell happened here? How do... What was the point of Bischoff? What the... What was the point of any of this? How the f*** do you win a show like that? Now that we've got all that anger out of the way, here's the apparent situation. 
Jeff Hardy disappears from taping two hours before his match. Five minutes before his match, he shows back up, assumed to be ready to perform. He heads out to the ring, clearly impaired. Sting comes out, sees that Jeff Hardy is not right. As an emergency audible, Eric Bischoff comes out, asks Jeff, Are you okay? Jeff says, yeah, man, I'm fine. Bischoff goes over to Sting and tells him, Jeff's definitely not okay. Brings up the no DQ clause as a reason for him to come out, even though it's bullshit. The match starts. Sting decides, this ain't worth it. Spams the finisher like he's a 12-year-old playing a fighting game online. And goes home. Need proof? Well, you can see here that Jeff Hardy is genuinely attempting to kick out, and Sting just dead weights him down for the three. And when the crowd chants bullshit at the end of the show, Sting loudly says, I agree. I agree, lady. What a close to so Jeff Hardy is written off of television for a few months to get sober. Sting writes out the rest of his contract with TNA before jumping ship to take part in a grimace off with Triple H in 2015. This is trash. The fact that Jeff Hardy wasn't just immediately fired for putting not only himself but but staying in genuine danger for wrestling that fucked up really. I, I, I've never really been a huge fan of TNA to begin with, and this. The show does not do them any favors. And I will say, in recent history, they've been making a lot better judgment calls and been moving in a much better direction. They've got a really, really great talent roster right now. They're uh, sort of blending into the indies a little bit more, and I think that's all for the absolute better. So, despite its flaws, I have to respect the direction it's going in, and I'll give it a pass to be on the shelf. There you are. Welcome to the club. Friday night match in the bedroom tonight.